start with my testimony, I kind of have to go back to when I was growing up. When I was growing up, I didn't come from a whole lot. I came from nothing. Uh, it wasn't abnormal for electricity, water, or gas to get shut off five, six times in a year. It wasn't abnormal being seven, eight years old, taking cold showers in December. I don't know if you ever took, took a cold shower in December, but you can't get warm. <coughs> but I just thought that was, that was normal. I thought everybody went through that. I didn't realize at the time that maybe I was in the minority of that. I had parents who were drug addicts, and some of their decisions led to kind of the lights getting shut off, the gas getting shut off, and things like that. As I started to grow up, I started to realize that, once again, I was in the minority of parents who are drug addicts, were getting you know the electricity and everything shut off, and I started to get, I guess you could say, uh, resentful, because I didn't like it. You know, I don't like to be put on the spot when you know your friends can't come over because you don't have any food in the house or you ain't got electricity, and you can't explain that to people. Especially not when you're eight, nine. So I didn't have a whole lot of friends when I was growing up when I was that age. I was saved at a real young age. Um, saved between 10 and 12 years old. It was April 17th, I know that. I was reading the Left Behind books because that was my escape when I was younger. I read books. And I've read everything from A to Z. And uh, I remember in the Left Behind books, well, they terrified me, especially not being saved. The thought of the rapture and the tribulations and everything and being left behind. And there's a there's a prayer in every one, and it's your prayer of salvation. And that's how I became saved. I was laying on a couch, and the sun was coming through the window, I remember it perfectly. And the feeling of euphoria when I finished my prayer is a feeling that I would chase from 15 to 24 almost religiously. Um I didn't realize it at the time, but looking back, I know that that's exactly what it is. <clears throat> when I was 15, it was me when I was 17. When I was 15, I was in the church house four or five times a week. I was there all the time. Not only to, to get fed and to be around and to fellowship, but it was also an escape from my home life. I heard the, the I heard calling to preach the first time when I was 14, 15 years old, and I was going to church all the time, and I knew that that's what I was, it was my calling, I knew that's what I'm here for. When I was 15, my parents got divorced, and I was getting checked out of school by my mom, who was, she was in a bad place, right after getting divorced, and I had to, had to check on her, I had to make sure she was okay. So participation and grades dropped significantly. I was checked out of school every day for I think 17 days straight, roughly the second semester of my ninth grade year. <coughs> and that's when I started, I don't know, not caring, because nobody else really cared. I was 15 years old taking care of my mom. My sister was gone, my dad left, and I got tired. My strength was gone, my will was shot. So that's when I started to hang out with the wrong crowd. Everybody knows the wrong crowd. Everyone's heard about it, whether you're my age or if you're in your 40s or so on. And that was the crowd I hung out with, and that's the crowd I became. Little did I know. <laughs> and uh, started skipping school and doing drugs. I started smoking marijuana daily when I was 15. That progressed as time went by, and by the time I was 17, that's what I looked like about every hour of every day. And looking back at it now, I'm almost ashamed. But at the time, I was 17. That's just what we did. That was, just the, that was just the way life was, sadly. My progression from 
marijuana to pharmaceuticals and pretty much anything in between. And I always told myself, you know, there's lines that I wouldn't cross. There was lines I wouldn't flirt with. And before I knew it, I didn't have a whole lot of lines left. I kept crossing them. I kept going over them. And it came to the point that when I looked into the mirror, I saw my dad and that just, that just disgusted me at the time. And it hurt my soul. But that euphoria feeling I was talking about during salvation was something that I was still chasing. I was still trying to get it from the day-to-day -day basis, whether it was this drug, that drug, or that one, whether it was a high from criminal activity or hanging out with my friends, I was chasing it. I didn't know it yet. <coughs> when I was uh, in June of 2013, I went on a camping trip. And this was, I think, like the third time we went on this camping trip, me and my friends. And I was driving my truck, first truck. I didn't get my license until I was 21 because I made bad decisions. I was driving my truck down to the lake, and on the way down there, I'm praying. And I didn't do a whole lot of praying, minus when I was afraid that maybe I would get, you know, the police would be behind me or something like that. I did some praying then. But I'm on the way to the lake, and I told myself that if something didn't change, on this trip, I was just gonna see how much my body could take before it gave out. And I believe my second or third day there, I started texting the woman who would become my wife. And that was like my first sign. Like something, something changed. So I started to back off of the things that I did religiously. We started dating and I proposed to her and when we came back, I believe a week or two afterwards, um, I hit my first low. And by my first low, I mean my bottom had a basement. And it was July and I was hanging out with my buddies, me and two of my friends. We was getting high, and my memo called me 11 o'clock at night. My memo never called me 11 o'clock at night. But I was like, you know, I'll call her back tomorrow. I'll call her at a decent hour. And uh, little did I know that was going to be the last chance I had to talk to my memo. She passed away probably two or three hours later. I remember being woke up at 7 o'clock in the morning, and that was the first thing that went through my mind was... Like the audacity of me, the woman that raised me and taught me what it was to be a man, taught me what love was, and I couldn't answer a phone call. And that's something that haunts me to this day, and it's probably something that's going to haunt me for the rest of my life. <clears throat> a little while later, um, what's that next slide? Oh, yeah. That was, uh, what was it, Easter? me and my wife and Bella when she was younger and uh, that's when I really started to change you can see the difference between the last slide and that slide it's almost night and day <coughs> two years ago um, a week ago I was given an ultimatum I was either gonna have my family or I was gonna have my drugs it wasn't a choice. I quit. And of course, like any addict or somebody who does something all the time, you always want a window, a time frame. Like, well, like let me get until New Year's. And I said, okay, you can have till New Year's Eve. So two years ago, right now, I was sitting on my front porch and I was getting high for the last time. And I was only doing it because it was the last time. I don't even, honestly, uh, that's, that's why I did it. It was like, this is the last time, you know, we gotta you know, go be or go home. And that's what I did. I sat on my porch from 11.15 till 12.05. And as the clock hit 
12 o'clock, I was done. I smoked a cigarette and just kind of thought, like, what is the next 60 days going to be like? I've been doing drugs religiously for almost 10 years. And for someone who coped with emotion and problems and even happiness with one substance or another, I was fixing to truly experience what emotion was like. The first 60 days was hard. To run away from everything for almost 10 years, well, that starts to hit you, one after the other, minute in, hour in. And I kept being told, you know, take it, take it one day at a time. If you can't take it one day at a time, take it one hour at a time, five minutes, you know, whatever increment you have to break it down to be able to go through the next day. <coughs> I was four months in being clean, and I thought that I was, I was, I was in there. I was ready. I, Lord, take it from me. I'm good. And. Uh, my cousin passed away, and that was uh, that was my that was my best friend. That was my brother. That was to, to just call him my cousin is almost insulting. He was the person that taught me. It wasn't a matter of I know you're gonna do stupid things, so let me show you the best way to do this stupid thing so you can stay alive or stay out of trouble. I was called. Um, I can't remember what time it was. I was in shock. I had like five phone calls. I was trying to get my daughter a bath. And uh, people kept calling me and telling me my cousin had passed away. And I kept telling people, like, just let me call you back. You know, I got my baby in the bath. I got to take care of this. I don't have time for this right now. Just hold up. And everyone's calling me because everyone knows the relationship I had with them. I finally I get my daughter out and it's time for her to go to bed. And as soon as I put her down, I get another phone call. And they're like, have you heard? And I was like, yeah, but I need more information. And then she, my wife calls me. She says, I'm on the way home. I said, okay. So I go and sit in my, in my chair, in my lazy boy, and I'm just sitting there just rocking. Thank you. Do I give it all up for sadness? Do I give it up for... This is what I've always done. Somebody passes away, something tragic happens, we just make a phone call, go down the road, come back, and we're okay again. But I'd give up everything. I knew I would give up my wife and my daughter, and that wasn't something I was willing to sacrifice. So I sat in my chair and I rocked. Probably 15 minutes, and she came through the door. And uh, the first thing she said, she was like, you know, I didn't expect you to just be sitting there and rocking. Well, I don't know what you expected. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not the crying type. At least not when people are in a room with me. And uh, the next few days are a haze. And that picture right there is, I'm giving my cousins, um, I'm giving this, this service. Uh, I asked to do a eulogy. And they gave me the reins for the entire memorial service. And that's when I started talking to my friend Josh over here again. And because uh, he also spoke, which was a, mu a great relief because that gave me a second to sit down and kind of gather myself. <clears throat> that's right before it started, about 20 minutes into it. I think we're in the third song. And I'm getting back up to talk again. And I feel it. That calling that I turned away. 11 years ago, it's right there. Like, this is what you're supposed to be doing. You're supposed to be talking to people. You're supposed to be this person that helped people get through these times. And it was loud. It was so loud. And I started to get overwhelmed with emotion, not because of where I'm at, but what I'm hearing in my head, which to me was, it was, it was the word of God. He just he was right there, just like this is what you're supposed to be doing. You've spent eleven years running away, but I brought you back. Here you are. We finished the last song and I made a beeline. I ran. I I, I hustled. I don't run. I hustled outside. 
And I knew I had to get outside, cry a little bit, and calm down before everybody else came outside. Sure enough, I had about two minutes, and everybody else came back outside, and my heart's broken, but at the same time, it's mending. It's simultaneous, because I know that I got some conversations to make with some people that I don't have and even talked to. And uh, <clears throat> I don't even know what the next slide is. Oh. <laughs> Two months after my cousin passed away, I started talking to Brother Jeff. And that was in June. I started talking to him in May. That's June, uh, was it 18th or July? And that is my licensing to become a pastor. That's one of the proudest moments of my life. I remember standing there looking out at the church and just thinking that I am not the person that should be standing here to get this license. That's why I got my hands behind my back. I don't know what to do. <laughs> but I remember the story of, of Saul. If Saul would have been, if Saul would have passed before his conversion, you know, where would we be? We wouldn't have half of the New Testament roughly. I could be wrong about that. Don't give, you know, don't quote me on that. But then I start thinking, you know, everybody knows the story of Saul to Paul, the conversion of, you know, who he was before. And I said, if the Lord can take this man who was persecuting his own people, whether he had a hand in, you know, the, the finishing act or just had the word in it, well, he can use me too. <clears throat> so I told myself that I was I've had a I've had a path I've had a, I got a great testimony I got maybe something that brother Jeff can't talk to somebody about that I could so I just that lit a fire in me I said I want to I want to change the world and I'm going to do it one person at a time if I have to and six months after that. Uh, my marriage was in a very rocky part. And I didn't know what to do. I was, once again, given the choice I was given when my cousin passed away. Do I give it all up or do I stay on the path? And that was a harder decision, even though I had more ammunition. I had God with me this time. I had I could pray like I've never prayed before. I could get into the Word like I never got into the Word before. But it was still a harder decision. But I ultimately made the right one. I stayed on the path. And that was my blessing for staying on the path, my son. Because we had tried for a long time. And I remember when she told me that she was pregnant, I just laughed. And laughed. And laughed. I just didn't know what to do. I didn't cry. I mean, I cried when she left. I was by myself. Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but I laughed because I was just, I was so happy. And I'm two years and 35 minutes clean. And I'm so proud. And that right there is what I have to show for. And that's makes me the proudest that I'll probably ever be right there. And that brings me to Acts 19, 15 through 16. And I knew the story, but I didn't know this verse. And to me, this verse just says it all. And this is, uh, Jesus is talking to Ananias, and Ananias is, is you know, Jesus telling Ananias to go see Saul on a street called Straight. And Ananias, you know, this is just my, my version of it. He's telling Jesus, I don't know about that. He's here to kill us. He's here to persecute us, take us back to Jerusalem. I'm, I'm good. But he says, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And that just became my life verse. Because I know I've suffered. 
and that was my own doing, but the Lord allowed me to suffer to hopefully be a light for somebody else in the darkness, to hopefully be that hand for somebody that's in their basement. And that, to me, is the greatest honor that I could ever be bestowed. <clears throat> and that is, that is my testimony. Uh, if anyone has any questions that maybe I could elaborate on, feel free to ask. If not, we'll just go right on into my message. No? Okay. You got a question? Okay, that's good. I don't wanna I don't wanna answer your questions. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> I believe this uh Isaiah forty 28 through 31. I believe this is a great coming into a new year passage. Because it's, uh, it's talking about the, the coming age, the, the messianic verses of the coming of Jesus. And what will, the benefits we will reap when he comes. Oh, okay. <coughs> Do you not know have you not heard the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, does not become weary or tired? His understanding is inscrutable. He gives strength to the weary and to him who lacks might he increase power. Through youth grow weary and tired and vigorous young men stumble badly. Yet those who wait for the Lord will gain new strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles and they will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. Have you ever been tired? And I don't mean physically tired. You had a long day. I mean, have, have your sails not had any wind in them? Like you didn't know what your next step was. I lived most of my life like that. I still have days like that. But this passage to me means that through my salvation and through my study of the word and through my prayer life that I can rise up, I can ascend to greater heights that I never knew was there. And only through Christ can I do that. I couldn't do that alone. I couldn't do that when I was chasing that euphoria, chasing that next high. I couldn't do it then because I was weary and he gave me strength. I had no power, and through him, the, the power was perfected. The eagles can fly above the storm. They don't have to fly through it. So with the updraft of God, I can go over the storm. If he chooses to put me through the storm, I know I'll, I'll persevere. It doesn't matter how bad the rain is or how bad the lightning is. My cousin always said... That without the, the rainy days, the sunshine ones wouldn't be too good. They wouldn't be fantastic. They would just be another day. By grace, we are saved, even though we were not worthy. And I believe that wholeheartedly, because who was I? What am I to, to Christ to go to, to the cross for me? I didn't do anything with the first 24 years of my life. But the promise is conditional, but only for those who wait upon the Lord. Only for those who call out and obtain and ask for the gift that's already been given. The promise is for strength and the promise is for those who have no might, those who have no wind in their sails. For even the saved, I, I, I'm saved and I still have those days that I just, I don't know. Can I get up and fight another day? And I stop and I pray. I read my little daily verse on my Bible app. And I'm ready. Amen. I may have a couple moments through the day where I don't know about it. But I'm here and I'm ready. I'm ready to keep fighting. And I, I just ask that if you're going through times like that, that you would remember that you
you also have the same you have the same resource that I have. And with that, I'd like to pray. Everybody would bow their heads. Me and Brother Josh are going to keep our heads up. Just uh, I'm going to ask some questions.